All right, we found someone who's better dressed than Greg was yesterday. <laughs> Tom Pelissero with us. Tom, uh, you've had a busy month, the coaching cycle and everything, a lot of, a lot of news that's been broken. Um, just what was your takeaway from all the moves the Bears made and didn't make, obviously, because they didn't change head coaches, but the coaching turnover on the offensive side of the ball? Well, I think that as they got later in the season and they started winning games down the stretch, especially after the trade deadline, the defense played a whole lot better. They were able to, you know, put string together some wins. They won games in the division. And so whatever opinions might have existed prior to that second half of the season, I think it got to a point where you see the arrow pointing up on the overall operation. How do we get even better? So they went through an extensive evaluation process over several days. They came to the conclusion the change of offensive coordinator was the direction that they were going to go, which makes sense because Matt Eberflus calls the defense. He's not going to fire himself out of that. And so, you know, you look to the offensive side of the ball. To me, moving on from Getze, who, listen, had a lot of challenges in Chicago, personnel and otherwise, played a bunch of games with a Division II undrafted quarterback this year and won some of them. Um, it, it was not an easy task. And Justin Fields, you saw flashes, but you also saw inconsistency. To me, bringing in a Shane Waldron, who comes from that style of offense, it's the McVay-Shanahan tree, I think that that suggests, again, not saying anything's fine, but that would suggest to me that they are making way for a quarterback change. Because Caleb Williams ideally would like to play in a certain style of offense that takes some of the pressure off. He's an unbelievable athlete. Depending on who you talk to, you know this is a generational type of talent. It's hard. Because even though the Bears have had the number one pick two years in a row, they traded it last year, you don't want to be drafting there often. If you're going to get that quarterback, it's a really unique opportunity. Again, I'm not saying anything's final. I'm not saying anything is decided. But to me, their moves externally would suggest that they're preparing for Caleb Williams to be there. So it's interesting the way you phrased it because that's how I'm looking at it. Everyone thinks logically that's what they're going to do. But with your context, are you hearing anything but behind the scenes that people are like, like there's a lean from inside, or is it just more the logic of the NFL people saying like you shouldn't do this again as far as passing on a quarterback when you're at that point at that point in the draft? Well, think about this again. So Justin Fields has been up and down. I think that's fair to say through the course of sure. his career. Missed a little bit of time this year. Durability hasn't been a huge concern, but you know, obviously his play style is unique. He can do some really dynamic things on the field. But in terms of like consistency, especially in the passing game, he's he has not yet found that through the course of his career. He's now entering the fourth year of his rookie contract. So you're either going to pay him or you're going to move on from him. Not necessarily this year, but over the next couple of years. You're going to have a really big decision to make that completely changes the complexion of your salary cap. So again, to lean back on logic, are you going to pay Justin Fields? Are you going to go and, and draft draft Marvin Harrison Jr. and put a bunch of pieces around? You could go that route, trade back, let Washington or New England or maybe somebody else vault all the way to the top of the draft, get a windfall of picks, continue building the overall roster. It's just hard to imagine, based on where they're at right now, if they're sitting there going, well, we're going to pay Justin Fields $50 million a year right now. Do they think that maybe new system could unlock him? Certainly possible. But again, I would lean back on the logic of when you make these types of moves, it would seem to point the arrow at the unique opportunity to go get that new guy. In that, in that regard, when you talk about the coaching hire, Shane Waldron, and Thomas Brown, lateral moves, guys that had head coaching you know, interviews, and then taking these moves here, I know there's an evaluation process still to take place at the Combine, talking to these guys in person, but they said they want to see what their plan was for both quarterbacks. Do you think at the end of the hiring process they did give them a more direction of what they're going to do at quarterback? Like To me, it's hard for me to believe that they don't at least have an idea of the direction they're going to go. You're talking about the coaching set? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that they've got a, a pretty good idea of what is going to be asked of them. But I think that also, like, you're, you're installing systems. You're installing processes as much as anything else here. Yeah, you're going to gear it around the players that you have. But, I mean, Shane Waldron over the last couple of years, I mean, he went into camp two years ago not knowing if it was Geno Smith or Drew Locke as your starter. Two different types of dudes, and the things that they do well uh, are a little bit different here. So, you know, I've known Shane a long time. He, he trained under Belichick. He trained under Sean McVay. He's a really normal, humble individual. And we've seen him, you know, with Geno Smith, who was a complete cast off and his career was essentially over, goes there, sits for a while, but then gets his opportunity and played really well at various points in the season. Now give Shane Waldron potentially the number one overall pick and see what he can go and do with him. Again, I'm not saying Justin Fields has played his last game as a Bear. We're still here on, what, February 6th, 7th, somewhere? Sure. Super Bowl week. We got two and a half months out to the draft. We also know this. Ryan Poles made the move last year to move the number one pick. 
very early in the process. He wanted to do that prior to free agency because then he would know what he needed to accomplish in free agency and have some certainty there. I would think he would like to get certain things resolved sooner than later, and maybe around that time you actually get to spend some time with Caleb Williams. Might be that time. Tom, it's a time-honored tradition in Chicago to argue about whether it's the OC's fault or the quarterback's fault. Um, so, it, naturally, the fans were not pleased with Luke Getze this year. Uh, I always say, how many fan bases actually like their offensive coordinator? Like the, you're winning, like three you're or not four. winning none. Yeah. yeah. Um, that being said, so I, it seemed like the view of Luke Getze, you know, outside Chicago, with the amount of interviews he got, was probably different than maybe how the fans were looking at him after the season in Chicago, at least. What kind of sense did you get for the interest? for Luke Getze and how he's viewed you know, more nationally within the league. And then, of course, he landed here in Vegas. Well, Luke's well, well regarded. You know, He was very close with Aaron Rodgers during their time together in Green Bay. I think the people look within the challenges that he had last year. I mean, I talked to Antonio Pierce yesterday, and he was saying one of the things with Getze is like, they came in, and kicked, I'm going to clean up for you, kicked yeah. the crap out of us in that game. And I'm like, didn't they start Tyson Bajan? He's like, yeah. And they went up and down the field on us. And I went, OK. So you see things like that, and that was, I believe, at the end of the, the Josh McDon McDaniels era, that was one of the games that kind of tilted things where Antonio Pierce took over here. But you see that, what he's doing with a Division II undrafted guy whose skill set's different than Justin Fields, and you're going, okay, let's play with a different style of quarterback and maybe this is going to fit more. There's always going to be criticism about how much you're adapting your scheme to the players that you have because ultimately it's a player's league. You need to, you need to gear things around what the player does best. But you're also thinking, okay, if we're going to have Justin Fields and just run zone read every snap and 15 to 20 times a game because he is a dynamic athlete and he can make things happen in space, he's also going to get hit. He's going to get beat up. That's not a sustainable thing. So what Luke Getzey tried to do was teach him those other things, get him to play under center, get him to play a little bit more for the pocket, not take away those other things. You're trying to develop this other part of this game. That part was a battle. And again, we saw Justin Fields have really good games. The game out in Washington, like you looked at him, he throws that touchdown in the back of the end zone, you're like, okay, like this guy can do it. But then you see the next week, and it's not the same. And that's that's the up and downs that you're talking about here. It's hard to pay that guy. Though I, I will say this, and, you know, because I'm not in any way bashing Justin Fields. If he becomes available, there will be a market for Justin Fields. I believe that. There's too many teams that don't have a guy, and there's enough coaches out there that look at other quarterbacks who maybe aren't polished passers but are really dynamic playmakers and have found ways to make it work. That's interesting. First round pick market? I was going to say, is there any path where, because I'm, I'm with you, like you just see how many teams are desperate for quarterbacks. Is there, right now it seems like everybody's thinking second round pick. Is there any chance teams get desperate and it ends up being somewhere in the first round? I mean, Carson Wentz. What was that two or three years ago in Indy? They had like publicly moved on from him. It was done. And then the commanders, or whatever they were called at that time, panicked and traded. I want to say it was like two threes, or a three that could become a two and a three. And that was a guy who was done. He was making $28 million. Justin Fields is still on a rookie contract. You're going to make a decision on the fifth year option. You trade for him. Do you pick that up? Do you not? That'd be a decision here. I mean, that, that's part of it is how do you look at the contract? Do you look at it as he's under contract for two more years? Do you look at it as he's under contract really for one more year at a lower number? But even if it's a one-year flyer, it's $6 million for Justin Fields for one year. Well, like, that's the thing. But if yeah. you're thinking it's a one-year deal and it's a one-year flyer, you're probably going to be more reluctant to give up you know, a higher pick. We, trades are weird now, man. Like, there's there's really good players who get you know traded for conditional sevens because of the money. With Fields, it's not a great deal of money, but that money is fully guaranteed. So are you thinking he's our is he competing to start? Is he a really good backup? Is he potentially the quarterback of the future? Do we pick up that option? So we've got him for two years and let's call it 30, 35 million. Those are all the things you'd have to have to evaluate here. But again, I, on the plane from Mobile, I went through the entire list of every team. And you would easily come up with 15 to 20 teams. You're like, I don't know what they're doing at quarterback. Like, really. And I don't think they know because there's so many different moving parts. Did you, did you have any type of injury from wrestling Tyson Bages? Dad? I mean, I'll tell you this, my elbow, like from my arm, from my elbow to my hand for about five minutes was numb after. I was like, ooh, this is, this can be very bad. But it tore in It came back, it came yeah. back, yeah. It was like the day after, that week after Brock Purdy had torn his UCL in the game. And I was like, yeah, this is what it, this is what it feels like. Me and Bajan's dad think he's going to the Hall of Fame. I love Bajan, but go you. Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury joins the Washington Commanders. Magic Johnson, obviously, is a guy that takes big swings with his days with the Lakers. How big a swing do you think he's going to try to get, take to get Caleb Williams? Well, I think Magic is certainly involved, but it's you know it's Josh Harris and it's Adam Peters and it's Dan Quinn, and I mean there's no question. Again, like 
we're still pretty early in the quarterback evaluation process here. Like, I don't think Dan Quinn is the defensive coordinator for the Cowboys. He's probably watched one second of Caleb Williams' tape, or at least hadn't until you know the past couple of weeks if he was preparing for job interviews. So they got they got to go through that entire process again. We'll see, like, there's weird things that happen. I mean, go back to, to like, use this game as an example, 2017 draft. And there was serious debate between Mitch Trubisky, Patrick Mahomes, and Sean Watson. And it was not unanimous from team to team, but a lot of people, the Bears are not alone, it was not just Ryan Pace, a lot of people believed Mitch Trubisky, they had him as the top quarterback just because he was the safest. You've seen him in a pro-style offense. He had the size, he had the big arm. You know, and then you kind of learned over time, unless you were booting him out to the right, Mitch kind of struggled to play at a consistent level. So, you know, again, we can all sit here and go, well, Caleb Williams is clearly the guy. Listen, he probably is, but Drake May, Jaden Daniels, they're going to have fans. Michael Penix is going to have fans. J.J. McCarthy is going to have fans. Let's see where we're really at here. Because even though you can say, well, it's only one spot from two to one, if one becomes available, everyone is going to be called. And so even moving up from two to one, you're talking about significant assets. Any validity to a lot of the different rumors surrounding Caleb or even his a relationship with his dad as far as, you know, trying to force not being in Chicago or equity in teams. You can, and try, you can try anything. The equity thing is um, not really allowed. <laughs> it's a very, we would require uh, probably some lawsuits and things like that. Um, but no, I mean, listen, they're in a unique position where they know everybody wants them. We've seen it a couple of times in NFL history. You know, I mean, John Elway, that's so long ago, that doesn't really count. But like Eli Manning was the last one where you really saw somebody engineer something to you know, get themselves out. Caleb doesn't have an agent. Normally, this would be the agent's job to try to shape the environment and get a guy to a certain place here. Caleb's in a you know a power position, but ultimately, if the Bears decide we don't care, he's going to be a Bear. You can draft him and just say you're coming here, regardless of how he feels. And I'm not saying he doesn't want to come to Chicago. What I'm saying is, even if you find that out or he expresses that, you still can draft him. You just say, okay, you can sit out a year and not get paid, and then go back in the draft. Like. Right. Good luck, but we're going to do this. There's a lot, a long way to go before we get to that. You haven't point. heard any inclinations that he wouldn't want to come to Chicago, from what you heard. I would just say it's very early in this entire process, and so we're still gathering a lot of information. Caleb's gathering information. The teams are gathering information, and that's just kind of how this process goes. Tom, thank you very much. I, I was harassing you the last few days here on Media Row, so I appreciate you spending a lot of time. Good, with good, us. Very good lesson. Harassing works. Yes. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> Closed mouths don't eat. Uh, we'll tell you right before you said that he wants. He's available. To come he really. Wants yeah, to come yeah, on. I think he does. We all silly like the mayor.